Hey, welcome back to another episode of Dear Baseball Gods podcast. I am here on location after uh, missing a week last week for no good reason at all. Uh, and I have a brand new black hat. So <laughs> I've, I've been wearing uh, Warbird Senators hats for the duration of these uh, the YouTube versions, which obviously are also the audio versions. But I feel like I needed a more like wardrobe neutral kind of hat because Columbia Blue uh, only goes with so much. And even though I've been wearing these uh, weird black shirts with like a saying on it that I've created also, like today it says baseball is a sport. Uh, so I have a nice obvious shirt on today. Um, but it's the first time I've bought a hat in probably five years because uh, I've had hair up until this point. Now that I'm a full card carrying bald man, I've decided that uh, sometimes I don't mind looking bald and sometimes I prefer to wear a hat. And uh, since I do a lot of obviously baseball content, uh, hat sort of fits the bill. So I went on this, uh, this thing. I said, hmm, I kind of pulled Instagram and I thought to myself, like, what, what would I wear on my head? Like, what team? Uh, because there's something weird about playing for or uh, wearing like minor league hats when, you know, for me, that's always kind of been on a chip on my shoulder since I didn't make it out of independent ball. Um, so wearing minor league hats feels a little weird, even though it's awesome ones. Also, it's also difficult to find a sort of like color neutral minor league hat. Uh, I bought my business partner, Lucas Cook, a Richmond Flying Squirrels hat maybe like three or four years ago as a Christmas gift. That one's black and red and white. That's one of the best logos in sports. a really cool hat. Uh, but obviously, I'm not going to get a duplicate of his. And so there's other ones like uh, the Montgomery Biscuits has always been a favorite hat of mine. I've known about that hat for years and years. They have a really cool, funny logo of a talking like biscuit with like butter as its tongue. Uh, there's some really cool ones suggested to me by one of my Instagram uh, followers is the Fresno Tacos. I think that's just the Fresno Grizzlies, but that's like one of their alternate hats. They do like times where they call themselves the Tacos. Pretty funny. There's the Chicago Dogs, which is an independent team, which is like a Columbia blue, red, and white hat with a just a hot dog on the front. Also would put me in the same predicament of being a very kind of like clashing with a normal outfit kind of uh, hat. So I decided I need something that was either white, which white's a little... You can't wear a white hat after Labor Day and uh, or gray or black. And I could wear like a lifestyle hat, you know, like one of those like like Heather Gray ones or something. But uh, I decided against it and I figured I'd go black and I would figure I'd just get one of those blacked out ones. So I had a blacked out Atlanta Braves hat as a kid because I grew up an Atlanta Braves fan because uh, I loved watching Smoltz and Glavin and, and Maddox and all those guys. Andrew Jones, Chipper Jones, Brian Jordan, Mark Wollers until he got the yips. Um, but... Uh, I'm not really a Braves fan anymore, and I really wouldn't feel comfortable wearing one of their hats because, like, I don't even – do they even have players? Any, I don't know. Like, I don't know any of the players on their team. So uh, I decided to go back to Baltimore, and I got myself an Orioles hat, uh, which the Orioles still have the best logo in sports. I mean, it doesn't matter. Your team allegiance, the Orioles, like, cartoon bird, the Woody the Woodpecker version – is still just the best logo in sports. It doesn't matter if you're a dire Cubs fan or Yankees fan. Like, clearly those teams are more successful. Uh, but just from, like, the quality of, like, the vintage, just it's just a great logo. So I got a black on a black one black Baltimore Orioles hat, even though they're going to go something like 17 and 144 this year. Um, so I'm rocking Baltimore. So that's kind of what we're going with. It's uh, not exactly fitting perfect today. I got to kind of wear it and break it in a little bit. I actually have a, I actually stuffed a sock in the back. Uh, I don't know if you, you can't see this here, but I stuffed the sock in the back so it'll, like, take out the slack. So it fits really well at the moment. But I'll probably get a headache halfway through this podcast, and, uh, you know, we'll see. But anyway, so today I kind of wanted to talk about the – the, the way baseball and just coaching and all the, just the industry as a whole is going, because it's crazy. I talked to one of my, uh, so one of my very first clients, a kid named Morgan. So Morgan, if you're listening, I'll, I'll text you. I'll make sure you listen to this one because you're getting a shout out. So w- one of my first four kids ever, I started with four boys in 2010, four kids from the same high school, well, three from the same high school, and then this kid Morgan. And uh, just, you know, whatever, like snot-nosed freshman, uh just high school baseball players. And they're my first four clients along with uh, 
couple of girls as well. So I had like this this sort of like original eight of like four, and they're all really high level players actually. Like of that first eight, I think like six went off to play college baseball, and I think half of them went off to play Division One baseball or softball or volleyball. So anyway, uh, Morgan now is the assistant. He's one of the assistants at Jacksonville University, and uh, we were just catching up on the phone recently, and we were talking about just the climate of of college baseball and getting jobs and all this stuff. And he brought up uh, Coach Lyle, who is now, I think, the hitting coach for Mizzou. And if you don't know who Matt Lyle is, he's just an internet hitting guy. I think he was actually a pitcher in college, which is strange. But if you read his story, um, it sounds like he uh, just at some point got really interested in hitting, transitioned, and just sort of like, I don't know, there's a part where he was like sleeping in his car. And uh, I don't exactly, I can't piece all of the get together all the pieces here on this podcast Uh, but I read a story about him and it was interesting and um, seems like a very genuine like good guy who is worth a follow like really passionate about hitting even though he didn't hit as a player which to me is a little strange but anyway he became like the the hitting coach for an SEC softball school last year and one of these articles about like you know like the most like celebrity person in the SEC is a is a hitting coach. Like he's got like 150,000 followers on different platforms and um, is a respected name in the hitting industry. So we just were talking about how like, he's like, you know, how does, how does a guy get a prominent job just like that, where he's just like jumping from softball, then right into high level baseball. And aside from the fact that the guy clearly knows what he's doing, it's just the change in the industry. It's not like the, the, the classic interview and resume and put in, two years at a junior college, two years at a division three, then move up to division two or division one, you know, be a volunteer for a couple of years. Then you finally get a paid assistant job at division one. Then you finally get your first head coaching gig. Then you grid it out there for a couple of years. Then you kind of upgrade up. It just doesn't seem like it's as much like that anymore. It's still clearly a lot like that for a lot of people. I have a bunch of former teammates and friends who are college baseball coaches, but it's uh, it's just rapidly changing. And what he and I both discussed is that he needs to get on the train of making himself exist on the interwebs. And so if you obviously are listening to this or you're watching my YouTube channel or you're following me, uh, you'll know that I've been doing the same. And uh, what I'm doing with my life going forward is multifactorial. There's a lot of different reasons I'm doing what I'm doing. And a lot of it has spurned uh, from the fact that I retired from my competitive career two years ago uh, identity crisis. What does phase two of my life look like? Because phase one was complete, you know, like the whole trying to become a major leaguer, uh, that phase ended. So I'm in like my middle third of my potential 90 years of life. And, uh, it's just kind of like starting from scratch and it's, it's starting like that for, I mean, that's how it is for a lot of guys when they finish their minor league or major league career. And of course, most of those guys finish younger. They finish at like 25 or something or 26 and they're, they're, uh, they got their three or four years in, and now they're joining the workforce a little bit late, but I'm joining the workforce uh, very late. You know, it feels to me like I'm, all right, I'm 32, I'll be 33 in December, and, uh, you know, things are like, what do I do now, right? I have a baseball academy, love my baseball academy. We're growing our teams. We're doing a lot of really cool stuff in person, um, but there's just like also other stuff in it for me. And I don't exactly know what that is yet. And, uh, but I know a lot of it, but I can, I can just like, for once I can like see the road ahead. I can see, I can't really see the road, but I know that whatever lies ahead for me, because I'm not going to work for somebody else. It's possible that in the future, um, you know, depending on how our academy continues to grow and all this other stuff that, uh, I don't know, there could be lots of different options, but in general, like I've always been an entrepreneur, I'm going to continue to be an entrepreneur uh, with my academy and with all these other endeavors. But in general, it's just uh, it's very obvious that the world is changing and it's changing really fast. You know, when I grew up, uh, not when I grew up, when I started entering the strength training business, the Internet was like just coming into fruition. Like there was lots of training articles. I was probably one of the first crops to read to read lots of training articles like Eric Cressy was writing a ton for uh, like T Nation, other other online publications when I was coming up 
And he uh, was like paving the way as like the first like industry big baseball strength guy. And Mike Reinald, who's a friend, he also was like that for the baseball PT world. He was the Red Sox uh, physical, I'm sorry, head athletic trainer. And uh, now he's still a prominent, you know, well-respected baseball PT. And But they were like sort of like the industry leaders, both Boston guys of uh, like this stuff is on the web. Like there wasn't a whole lot else to read back then. Uh, because the internet was still kind of new. One of my, my mentors, Nick Tumanello, who's still kicking it in Florida, flying around the country, speaking and, and teaching personal trainers. It's eerie because my career is, is uh, mirroring, his, mirroring his in a lot of ways. When I was his intern as a senior in college, uh, well, actually, we, I started as my, my fourth year. It's just so annoying to say that I was a, a senior than a super senior, but I started uh, interning, interning with him, not for school credit, just because I was a philosophy major. I didn't get school credit for exercise science majoring or uh, internships. But I, uh, I interned with Nick in 2008 and then again in 2009 into my last year. And then uh, still a little bit after I graduated. And then we kept in touch over the years. But when I was, uh, so I was like this young gung-ho, going to make into pro baseball, like super in shape, no days off, like absorbing everything nutrition and fitness that I could at that point and I met Nick and he was probably 30 31 32 at the time which is about my current age now I'm 32 and he was transitioning out he was like you know I trained personal training clients for 10 hours a day for six six to eight years something like that he's like my schedule was packed He's like, I made a lot of money doing it, but I'm like, he's like, I just can't keep doing that pace for forever. He's like, so I'm transitioning and I'm starting to write and uh, I'm starting to like do some videos and I, I'm starting to like speak at seminars and stuff. So he was like hitting the second phase where he learned a ton over 10 years plus being a, a successful personal trainer, working in a gym first, then his own studio and then kind of backing out of his own studio and then renting space from a former business partner. And, uh, and he was a little bit out of shape at the time. And I didn't get it at, at 30 or 32. Like he was a fitness, like industry expert. And he was still like in good shape, kind of like the same way I am. Like I'm still in good shape. If you see me, like I still look athletic. I'm in good shape. I'm not fat. But like for me, comparing myself to myself as a college, like animal in the weight room, like I'm out of shape, right? He was in that same sort of boat. And he admitted, he was like, man, I haven't lifted in like nine months. Like I'm just like, I just like can't. I'm just like burned out of it. And I didn't get it at the time, but I get it now because when I broke up with baseball, I also broke up with weight training. I'm just like, you need to go uh, because I don't know, like, I don't know what your point is anymore. Like, if you're not going to get me towards that baseball goal, I don't know what we're doing. I don't, I don't care about my squat. I don't have to compare, like, my manliness has nothing to do with how much weight I lift. Uh, I'm more manly than other dudes, no matter how much I lift. And, uh, so I just didn't, uh, like there's just, there were almost no incentives for fitness and I'm finding new ones now. Finally, a couple years later, that's been in a whole number, a whole nother thing. But anyway, I didn't get it at the time. I'm like, but you're a fitness guy. How can you like hate working out? I'm like, but I understand now. And anyway, so he was transitioning out and just starting to write articles for different sites. And of course he was a reputable trainer. He'd done a lot of training and he was a really smart guy. He still is. Uh, and so he started to get out there and started to build a following. And this was still really early. This was 2008. Like, I mean, that doesn't seem that long ago, but the internet has changed at a massive amount in 10 years, just a massive amount. And, uh, like people didn't really have like big YouTube followings, like Instagram didn't exist. Facebook like wasn't really a big deal. Snapchat doesn't exist. None of these things existed. And, uh, like podcasts weren't a thing. It just like, it, you could write fitness articles and you could do some YouTube videos and like, 480p and uh throw them and embed them on there and that was like the thing so uh and here we are today so i've i've seen the internet change and back then you read articles and you and you started to have new things you could learn like i knew a lot more at 22 just entering the strength coach industry because that was the first job i had i was a strength coach right as i graduated from from college and didn't have any place to play because i was still rehabbing my elbow you know, there was, I, I had more resources then because I had a couple of different internships I did and I didn't major in exercise science. I just bought textbooks and I read a lot. I got certified in college and uh, I just read T Nation a ton, which if you don't read T Nation, if you're a coach or a strength coach or you're interested in fitness, you really should read it. I don't write for it anymore. I ended up writing for them. 
about two years after I graduated from college. I wasn't ready at first, but, and then I ended up, I think there's about 25 articles in my name on T Nation. It was a, a cool thing because that was the very first thing I ever read about strength and conditioning. And I read it because my strength coach, Fred Cantor, suggested that I do that because I said, I, I want to know more about how to get better. Like, what should I do? And he said, well, read this article uh, or read this website. He's like, here's a bunch of names. You know, Eric Cressy was one of them, Tony Gentilcore, uh, Chad Waterbury, uh, Chris Sugar writes a ton of nutrition stuff. Um, my old editor there, TC Loma, loves, he does some really funny stuff and some good motivational pieces. Um, there was just a really good lineup. Uh, Brett Contreras, the glute guy, Nick Tumanello, obviously, I was, that's how I found him was through Teen Nation, and he was in Baltimore. So I read that, and then I started writing for Teen Nation a couple years after, after I got a, a couple years under my belt as a strength coach. And uh, I wrote for them for about three or four years off and on. It was about an article a month, actually, for the first couple of years. And then I just, I kind of got, I don't know, I just I kind of moved on. But anyway, so that was like the early part. That was like the internet was starting to change. And you as a, as a young coach could read all that stuff and gain five years, 10 years of experience from reading all these articles and watching all these videos and doing it yourself and doing it with your clients. Like you could just get way smarter, way faster. That was the big change. Whereas prior to that, you had to just like be a strength coach. You had to learn from people in person. You, there was no other outside source to really learn how to be good at that job. And now as you, as you flash forward, this was my point, as you flash forward to today, kids know more. Uh, there's still, I mean, there's still so many incompetent people out there. There's so many incompetent hitting coaches, pitching coaches, strength coaches, baseball coaches, softball coaches, uh, just everyone. Is, there's still just so many incompetent people. They think they know what they're doing. They just know enough to be just horrible. However, there are also way more people who really do understand vastly more than, I mean, you should be able to understand about hitting or pitching or strength training or any of it at a really young age. I mean, you have 16 year old kids who have a good idea about how to form a workout, like what good training looks like, what a good hitting coach looks like. They can discern if you're a quack or if you're not. And there's a lot of trolls out there and there's a lot of kids who will post comments, oh, this guy doesn't know what he's doing, oh, he's teaching the swing wrong, and they don't understand the nuances of like, no, I do this for a living, and this is why I'm explaining this, because I have years of experience doing it, and just because it looks wrong to you doesn't mean you understand why. Like, there's still tons of that stuff. Like, there's still a massive need to do the job, and that's what people don't get, and that's where the inco a lot of the incompetence comes in. But uh, the internet's changing so much because you can learn so much and be right out of the gate I mean, you can have a lot of knowledge uh, to, to help people with. And so the whole traditional like interviews and resumes, and this is the channel I go through my, my major and my internship and my job and you know, entry level, and then I, I move up the ranks, then I get my own. It's just changing. It's just very, very different. And when you talk about how internet followings can help you, how they can help you monetize uh, your brand when you build a brand, how if you have a product to sell, um, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a good example. I don't want to like disclose. I don't, I don't tend to dis disclose many things, but I'll let you know about my book. So my book, it's in the background. For example, uh, I sold, I don't know, five copies a month on average since it was released in 2013. Uh, sometimes two copies a month, sometimes zero, sometimes eight. Uh, and then this past year when I revived my email list, when I started putting out content again, when I started nurturing people that subscribe to my email list, I send them like good free content that I create or that I find, you know, on a weekly basis. I don't ask anything in return for it. Uh, once in a while I might say, Hey, like, here's the thing you can buy. But because I do that, because I advertise, uh, because I nurture my email list, because I put my book on my website where you can find it. I didn't even have it on my website for a long time. Um, because I'll put it in my bio, I'll put links to other places. It's on Pinterest. It's in just in various places. I sell 15 to 20 a month now. Um, and so you just like, think about all those different things and how you can slowly piece together a living. Uh, there's just so many different ways. We have a girl in our academy. She has an Instagram account. She has 45,000 followers. It's a softball Instagram account. She reposts, she makes memes, she uh, posts videos, all of her followers send her videos of them playing. She'll like repost the best ones. She's, she has a huge following. It's crazy. And I don't think she understands it yet, but 
she could make a significant amount of money doing that and legitimize herself. And you see a lot of these like stars, especially I think on the female side, you can see some, you see a really like really talented female athlete. Um, many more people I think gravitate towards them than like the talented male athletes in college. Um, uh, but you'll see like, there's a, there's a couple, there's a Texas A&M softball player. She's a really big following. She's got a great swing. She's really athletic. Um, when she gets done college, I'm sure she can just hit the ground running pretty much anywhere she wants. Like, Oh, this person, Oh, she's a name. She's got a hundred thousand followers. And when she posts stuff, it like makes sense. Like she's clearly like a hard worker and was like a good player and, and can convey information. Well, she's going to get a job over all these other people that went through the traditional like college coaching, uh, channels, if that's what she wants to do, it's just a hypothetical example. But, uh, with all, like all these things, they really, really matter. I mean, this girl that we have, uh, who's seven, 16 now, she could potentially, if she wanted to build her brand, uh, continue to build her Instagram, create websites, create products, or use other people's products, sell them or the affiliate marketing, all these different things. And she could just not go to college and make probably a pretty good salary just through her entrepreneurial endeavors because of an Instagram account that she created at 14 years old. I mean, she really could. I mean, there's it, but here's the thing. Uh, what, a lot thing a lot, what I think a lot of people don't understand is like, yeah, there's a lot of accounts out there. You see, this guy has 35,000 followers. This person has a million followers. Unless it's like something where just people automatically gravitate towards it or it's, you know, like for me, it's not super easy. I have like 4,500 Instagram followers, for example. Didn't nurture it all this last year. I am, if you're around, you can probably see like there's a lot of consistent content coming from my account now uh, because it's important because if I don't do it now, I will not exist in the future. I just won't exist. And no matter what I want to do in the future, because I don't exactly know. I know I want to speak. I know I'm going to continue to write. I know I'm continue to do a lot of the things that I do, uh, but I don't know exactly what capacity and what form, but I know that if in five years I don't have 50,000 followers or whatever, I'm just making up a number. I won't really exist. If someone's like, Oh, should this guy come speak at our conference? He has 400 followers. He has some photos of dogs and like his girlfriend and, and his car on his Instagram account. Doesn't have a website. Doesn't do this. Doesn't do that he doesn't even exist. He's like, he's not an expert. Like that's how people think having a big Instagram account or a big Facebook following or whatever. It doesn't make you an expert. There are lots of people with big followings who don't know anything who are very incompetent, but are good at creating followings. And I think there's also a lot of people who are really good at coaching who are really good. And they think I don't want to do all that other stuff. It's too much work. And it is an absolute nightmarish amount of work. Uh, I wrote down everything I have to do this week last night. Cause I just have like, I'm like pulled in so many different directions with different projects that I have to like, probably like every two weeks, I feel like I don't know what I can even start on some mornings because I have like so many different things that need attention. And, uh, so I usually like get on pen and paper and I write down everything I need to do. And I start to like plan and organize everything. And that helps me. And then I kind of get going again. But there's so many things to consistently do. So if, for example, in addition to like, this is our quiet season of the year. It's September. We have practices on Sunday. I do a hitting class in two hours from when I'm filming this right now. Uh, there's strength training classes. We, we have a strength coach. We have two strength coaches, my partner, um, lessons are minimal. It's like kind of a quiet time. My facility There's a lot of planning for our, our baseball organization. Uh, but even now that's like somewhat quiet at the moment. So with a lot of my other endeavors, uh, I have 21 Instagram posts to create this week. That's video clips. That's, uh, motivational quotes as part of mine. Um, that's 21 pieces of content that I'm responsible for. And if I can do more than 21, I will. I also have to feed Snapchat, uh, which I've been failing at currently for our Academy. I'm failing at my own as well. I post like a photo of like an old Bay seasoning can like once every three days. Um, I have Facebook for three accounts. Um, I just created a softball website to put my softball content separately from my baseball content. So I have a new website with a new Instagram, which I haven't put anything into yet, has a new YouTube channel and a new Facebook page. So currently I need 21 Instagram posts per week. Um, I need to write at least a blog post a week. 
starting now, uh, really should have been starting a couple months ago for EliteBaseballPerformance.com, which I'm the baseball coaching editor for. Um, and then really that comes down to eight YouTube videos a week that I need so I can schedule them out a couple weeks ahead of time so that I have at least two come out per week, hopefully three. Uh, and then there's a couple in softball each week as well. So I have to do a couple of softball ones. Um, we need Instagram TV is a couple things that we're doing because those cross posts to Facebook. We have our podcast for twinsies, which uh, we don't advertise that much, but you should definitely listen to it. I have to do my podcast. They have to be uploaded to YouTube and to audio. So that means cover slides and cover images for 10 YouTube posts uh, for twinsies and uh, for dear baseball gods. And uh, on top of that, I have to edit my book. I'm hoping to do a chapter a week, if not more. Um, I think I have 10 chapters left in my third draft, and I'd love to finish that within six months. Um, there's just like, I have to tend to Pinterest. Uh, I have a Pinterest account, which, help, which helps get my softball content out there the most. And 22 pins post each day, so I have to make those every in batches, like every couple months to advertise blog posts and videos and stuff like that. Um, so I spent about 10 hours doing that in the last two weeks. Um, it's, uh, and it just like continues to go. It just continues to go. I have to tend to all that stuff. And then I, the other thing on my list now is, uh, starting to email universities and high schools. I need to start getting uh, speaking gigs lined up. I've not done that. That's kind of been on my back burner, but it's now my number one priority to get some lined up for the fall and winter. So I want to speak on a couple different topics. Number one, the mental game, just sharing stories and motivating young athletes because I've been through a lot. And the other thing I really want to speak on is to universities. So if you're a university athletic director and you want to have me come talk to your kids about the transition into real life after they graduate, after their sport is over, I'm going to come talk to your university. Uh, because it was a really tough thing for me to go through, and it's a tough thing for every athlete to go through, and no one seems to want to prepare you for it, but I'm going to help prepare kids for it. So that's sort of like in a nutshell all the stuff that I do to not not exist in five years. And I know that it will pay off. It does not pay off at all today. It puts almost no money in my pocket. It uh, is slowly building up trust with people that they get free info from me, and I help kids and I give back to the game that gave me so much. Um, but it's also going to help me put food on my table in a couple years. It's going to help me put my kids through college in 15 years. And uh, the world is changing so fast that if we don't do this stuff now, well, none of us will exist. So if you're a high school coach or you're a, a college player and you're going to the real world and you think you might want to coach, you better start a YouTube channel. You better start a Instagram account that's not just bull crap. That's something like shows that you actually know what you're talking about. You need to start a website. I've created, I think I just created a new one. I think I've created 12 websites in my life now, which whoop de doo uh, but it's like a skill and it's, uh, something that's useful. And, uh, I, since I know how to do it, I just whipped up one, uh, for my softball content because now as I email my softball, uh, email subscribers, I can say, Hey, here, Go check out this blog post on snapsoftball.com and uh, check it out. I hope it helps you out this week. That's pretty much it. But separating out my brands, like am I a baseball brand? Am I a softball brand? I don't know sometimes. Uh, I love helping both. I think girls are super undervalued. I think female athletes are amazing people. I think they have as much to gain from strength training and from just training and from people taking an interest in helping them get better as anyone. Um, I think the girls in our facility, I think, pick us up as trainers more than anything else. They don't come in with a chip on their shoulder. They come in just with like, just good intentions and hard work. And, uh, they're just awesome people to be around. And on the softball side, so few of them get good throwing instruction that I am, I've been very proud to have helped intervene with some girls careers where they learn to throw five, 10 miles per hour harder from simple stuff that I would teach a baseball kid. And, uh, and so like, I don't want to give up on that, but it also conflicts with like the fact that I'm a baseball guy. It doesn't conflict. It's just like sometimes confusing when you're on my website, what it is that I do, what it is that I am. So I made a different one and I have a different YouTube channel and I just have more things. So I have two YouTube channels and I like all this crazy stuff. And, uh, I'm telling you this because 
number one, I don't think people understand how much work it is just to exist on the internet. And if you exist on the internet, you can't just exist on Facebook. You can't just exist on Instagram because different people, I get messages from, I get emails from my website. I get snaps. I get messages through Instagram. I get people message me through Twitter. People message me on Facebook. Uh, that's like five or six different types of communication. And if I don't have a Facebook, I miss out on all those parents that have questions about their kids, about baseball or need something from me or whatever it is, or want to buy something from me. Um, you have to have like all the platforms. Like it just doesn't, it doesn't go away. And if you listen to anyone, I think if I was to recommend it, one person, you'd be Gary Vaynerchuk to listen to his, just listen to a couple YouTube videos from him. He's extremely authentic, which is why I like him. He's a extremely, extremely hard worker, which is, I think one of the reasons I can relate to him. And, uh, he doesn't sugarcoat it, but he's got a great book called the thank you economy. He's got another great book called crushing it. They're both about how to, treat customers right and how to grow your business with social media and what the purpose of social media is and helps you understand it. Cause I did certainly did not understand it at all. Uh, my knowledge of what each platform does and how they're different has dramatically increased every year, uh, every six months, every couple of months, I'm still figuring it out because the way you grow an Instagram account is not the way you'd grow a, so a Twitter account. The way you'd grow a Snapchat account is not the way you grow a Facebook account. They're all just very different. And I could summarize them. I'm going to summarize. I'm just going to go ahead and summarize them right now. Facebook is for the parents. Uh, it should be interesting and it should be something that like kind of has an emotional response about their kids. It's all parents on Facebook. So I used to just repost my articles on there and some people read them, but for the most part, it's just like has nothing. And uh, I am not as good at Facebook posting as I could be as a, as a businessman, I guess. Um, I like, th here's my content. That's why I've been like throwing it over there, just like throwing it on Facebook, but that doesn't really, that doesn't really reach people. And if you want to reach people, you have to do it in the right way that they want to be reached. Uh, Snapchat is like kind of like behind the scenes. Like people want to know like who the real you is. So on my Snapchat, I like, it's a little more of that. I'm trying to like vlog a little more, but I'm still not sure how interesting my life is. I'm super interesting, but like, I just work on my laptop most of the day work out, uh, sleep, eat things covered in old bay and call, <laughs> call it a day. But, uh, Snapchat is kind of like behind the scenes. It's like a chance for them to get to know you as a person. Instagram is a little bit of both because the Instagram stories are kind of a little more like that. And then people want to learn something on Instagram. They want to see something cool. They want to be inspired. They want to learn something video like Instagram is really more of a video platform than a photo platform, depending on what you're doing, what you're selling. So for sports it's a video platform. If it's for fashion, it's a photo platform, right? It's different. Uh, and just like the art of captioning and using hashtags and all these different things and trying to get people to like engage with it and like think, wow, like I'm glad I looked at their account today or like I look forward to their daily posts. It's, uh, it's challenging. It's different. And there's all these other things about Instagram, how to get seen on it and the metrics. That's a whole different thing. But in general, people go to Instagram, especially if it's sports related, to like see something, get a highlight, learn something. Uh, like a little tidbit of info. So it's, and then there's YouTube. YouTube is, I think, often very underrated. I remember there's a couple guys on there that I kind of have been watching what they do. So uh, if you look at, I'll use Yugo Pro, uh, John Madden, I don't know him, seems like a decent guy. I've noticed his posts throughout the years. Uh, he doesn't have a huge like website presence. He has a very strong YouTube presence. If you type in any baseball search result, like how to throw a changeup, how to throw a curveball, you'll find like five of his videos. And he clearly caters to like a younger audience, but the guy knows what he's talking about. And uh, he helps a lot of people. He's a really big following. He's like 100,000 uh, YouTube subscribers. And that's clearly like YouTube is clearly the thing that he focused on for all these different years where I was like a blogger. I wrote a lot, like I love writing and everyone's different but uh, you have to pay attention to them all. So like there's a lot of value in YouTube. That's why I'm putting a lot of effort into YouTube. And uh, it's just like everyone's different. And so I've, I've watched what he does. So, you know, if, you're, if you've watched any of, uh, again, you go pro baseball, John Madden, if you've watched any of his videos, like you'll see like he knows what he's doing. He's got a cover image. He like asks you to subscribe because those are important. Um, he wants you to be engaged with his videos and, uh, he gives it a lot of good content. Like the guy pitched, he knows what he's doing. He, and he knows what audience he's talking to. He's talking to parents and the kids for the most part, right? It's not to say he doesn't know how to train older, like really high level pitchers. But I'm sure he does. 
but he's also not trying to go over their heads, right? If you, uh, if you engage with like driveline baseball stuff, right? They're a very specific group. They're preaching more to like coaches and like higher level guys. Like if you're a young kid, you're not going to really understand. Or if you're a parent and you're layman, a lot of their stuff is really confusing and it's not layman and it's not relatable in a lot of ways. It's very like just very different. And that's okay, and that's completely fine. I'm not bashing them in any way. They put out a lot of good thought and a lot of good content. Everyone's just different, and it depends on what your niche is too. But going back to my overall point, if you're a baseball coach or you're a baseball guy or you want to stay in the baseball industry or whatever sport it is, doesn't matter what it, what, what you do, or if you're going to leapfrog um, careers, you need to have a web presence. You will not exist. And I've been imploring my parents to both do this. My dad, I built a blog for him. I was like website number nine or something. Uh, he hasn't really used it that much. He's trying, but he also has been a columnist his whole life. He, he's struggling to, to fit the mold of what a blogger is. Like a, writing a blog post is very, very different than writing a column. It's, he's also written a couple of books. Uh, well, he's published one. He's in the process of his second. Uh, he's been a prolific writer. It's very different changing the, the style of writing. Right? I can write a blog post in 35 minutes if I want to. Because I'll use a video, I'll kind of bullet it out, I'll make a couple headlines, I'll make it short and to the point with four, four line paragraphs, and it'll be very dense with info. You can skim it and be like, here's how you do this, here's how you do this, here's exercise two, here's exercise three, here's exercise four, here's how you put them together, video, 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 blog, and that's the blog post. Because that's kind of how the internet is nowadays, and it's changing. So if I was to write these long wordy, you know, without a lot of videos, a lot of, out a lot of multimedia it just wouldn't reach as many people. And you want to try to reach different people. So I might have a video that explains a whole concept and I'll embed it in a blog post that also just re-explains within the video, but in text. So in that blog post, you have like two choices. You can read it and watch the video. And like, they'll be both explained in a little different ways, but it's the same thing. Or you can just read it or you can just watch the video. Everyone's different. You're just trying to reach people, right? Um, and they're always just like they're a supplement to each other. So it's just the point of this Dear Baseball Gods episode. And let me not get uh, let, me, let me not forget the podcast land because podcasts are more popular than ever. We started doing Twinsies and we started doing Dear Baseball Gods as uh, only audio. So they're on iTunes, they're on Stitcher, they're on you know we use Blueberry as our service. They're on Blueberry, they're on uh, Spotify now, which is great. And uh, that's more adults and like young adults listen to podcasts. Like high school kids don't listen to podcasts really. It's just like not their medium, uh, but YouTube is. And so we decided finally, like 40 episodes in, we would start doing YouTube versions. So now we just record into it and I just extract the audio. I upload it into, into iTunes or into Blueberry Land, whatever. And now we have two versions of the same piece of content. One reaches more of adult audience. The other one reaches more kids and adults. And people who just like want to watch me like act out stuff with my hands and look at my stupid Orioles hat with the sock stuff in the back, right? It's just, it's whatever. But the point is so many people think about your own internet habits. Think about how you interact with the internet. You might be a podcaster, blog poster, or blog reader. You might read medium and news and you might really like Snapchat and you follow a couple people on Instagram, uh, that might be you. Somebody, someone else might be Facebook and, uh, and, and, and articles. Someone else might be podcasts only, podcasts and audiobooks. Me personally, I don't listen to podcasts. I create two of them, but I don't listen to them. I like audiobooks. I like articles because I still like to read. Um, I YouTube more actually now because I'm, I've been interested in what other YouTube people do. So I've been l listening to them and watching them. And I find a lot of value in YouTube. Like I listened to three YouTube uh, videos last night. Actually, they're all authors of people I've wrote, uh, I listened to. So I listened to three different authors that I've read their books. I listened to them speak last night. Pretty valuable. It was, a, it was a different way of hearing. And I heard some of the same stories, but it was just like another way to embed it in your brain. So everyone's different. But again, my, my thing is, if you want to be an, a marketer, and this is what I've been doing with our intern, Taylor, I'm forcing her to make a website because... And to do some other stuff, because if she's going to be in digital marketing and they Google her and she doesn't exist, she's just like everyone else in the pile of resumes. 
if you want to be not in the pile of resumes, you want to be on the internet. And that's how actually I got my first job here in Bloomington Normal. I was, I got the pitching coach job at an upstart baseball academy franchise, extra innings. They eventually went bankrupt. Uh, but I got the job because the general manager read my blog. I didn't even submit a resume. I just was like, hey, here, I, this is who I am. I play pro baseball, I uh, blah, blah, blah. I have a website, you can check it out. You know, this is what I'm about. And the guy read my website and he was big in a strength conditioning. So he was like, yeah, you should hire this dude. I read a bunch of his stuff. He knows what he's talking about. That was it. That's how I am here today. That's how Warbird started. That's how, like really, like how I am here today. I did that 10, you know, not 10 years ago, but eight, eight, nine years ago now. And that was then when the internet wasn't a big deal. Now everyone, like you Google everybody, right? So if you want to get that next coaching job, be different than everybody else. Uh, if you want to like be long-term stable in your business, be better at the internet than everybody else, because you know, you're going to have more competitors pop up every year. And if they have better internet presences than yours, they're going to steal your customers away, or they're just going to get the new kids that come up and they're like, who should I go train with? I don't know any of these five businesses, but I follow business a on Instagram. And I really think their trainers are cool. And the kids look like they're having fun there. That's kind of how it works. So it's just very, very different. And uh, I don't remember what the point of this podcast episode was, but um, it's what it is to be a baseball guy, what it is to be a strength coach, what it is to be, and anything is rapidly changing. And if you kind of don't get on board now and start doing something, you don't have to go from zero. Like I feel the same thing as everyone else does. When I look at these other people, I'm like, God, God, I'm so far behind. Like that guy's got 95,000 followers. And uh, I don't think he's better than I am. Like, I think I'm the best at what I do. I really do. Like, I don't think that guy's better than me, but he's way ahead of me. How am I, it just feels like help. It feels hopeless that you're ever going to catch up and like have the the audience that they have. Uh, But you have to remember just like everything else. And it sounds stupid, but that dude started with zero followers at some point. And then he had 500 and then he had a thousand. Then he had 4,000 Then he had 12,000. Then he had 32,000. And now he's got a hundred. And if you don't just get started, it's never going to get there either. And if you do get started, it will probably get there as long as you continue to get smarter and work hard at doing it. And, uh, some, you know, one of the common comments is when I like see an old friend or see my, they're like, I don't know how you put out so much, like, how do you put out that much content, Dan? And, uh, the answer is that I, I work like 12 to 16 hours every day. So I don't really have leisure time. I don't really watch, well, I don't watch TV. Uh, I'm trying to like do something that's valuable to me every minute that I can. Now, obviously I eat lunch. There are times I just space out. There are times that I'll watch something on YouTube. There are times that I'll just like, just, I'm still a somewhat like kind of normal person, but I really work literally all day. I, I literally work all day. So that's how, like, that's how I get it all done. And I still like fall short, but I have three online courses to finish this fall. And then when those are done, I'll have three more that I want to create. I need to finish my book. I still have 21 Instagram posts to create this week. I have 10 more YouTube videos to do. I need to edit. I need to create more blog posts for elite baseball performance. Like there's just like a never ending list and I just will continue to keep doing it. Uh, And at some point that will have some sort of payoff. But right now I'm just like a poor person that just does tons of stuff for no pay (laughs) but it's the long but it's the long game and but i know that in a couple years like i will be positioned exactly where i wanted myself to be because of all the efforts today because of the 12 to 16 hours that i'm working on stuff because i don't have a wife and kids to like i can just come home and work from 9 to 2 a.m which i do a lot of times Uh, I can get up at eight and work till three and then I can go to my academy and I can do my thing there and then I can come home and I can work from nine to one or seven to one or whatever it is. And again, that's just like kind of how it goes. So you can outwork the next person and put out more content to them and like hit more people by being on more social media streams and more platforms and uh, you'll eventually win. And I'm planning on eventually winning And it's just been a long, interesting road from that college kid as an intern watching one of my former mentors, again, Nick Tuminello, start this this same phase that I'm starting now, which is like, 
I'm not going to train people 10 hours a day. I'm going to reach more people by training trainers or by speaking or by making videos and still train a lot of people, but I'm going to start transitioning to be an educator. And that's sort of where I am. And, uh, but no matter what field you're in, if you ever want to get out of it, say you want to be a kayak guide or you want to be a, a, a you want to own a mountain bike store or whatever it is you want to do, or you just want to switch careers. If you have a presence and demonstrate your knowledge and your, and your wealth of experience on the web, beyond just a resume, you're going to be more valuable than the next person. And in five or 10 years, that is going to be maybe like the, pretty much the way all this stuff works. And it's going to certainly be the way that people get highly competitive jobs over another. And, uh, I personally am preparing for that. I'm preparing that. Cause I know that if, what I was doing two years ago or three years ago was the same stuff I was doing now and is the same stuff I was doing in five years, I'd be obsolete in five years because you can already see it. There's people younger than me finishing their careers in baseball and they're like coming for me on the web. It's just like how it is. And they're not stupid people. They're smart. They had some baseball experience. They threw hard or they hit the ball hard or whatever. They've got the look. They've got the image. They're younger. They connect. They grew up in, in this uh, social media era. They, like, they know what they're doing and they're going to build a following and build a brand and they're going to put old people like myself out of business. And uh, I'm not old <laughs> either. So if you're 40 or you're 50, um, you need to adapt quick. You know, you just, it, that's just how it is. So uh, that was sort of what I wanted to blabber on about today in my podcast. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been a constant thought. The internet is a crazy, weird animal and uh, the baseball industry is changing. It's changing rapidly. And uh, since I assume there's some high school coaches and some other coaches out there, don't take your internet presence lightly. If people Google you and they can't find you, you don't exist. You only exist in your little current world. And if you ever want to get bigger than your little current world, uh, you won't until you get out there and you're a person that exists and has and commands some attention on the internet. So that's what I got. Anyway, hope you enjoyed my Orioles hat. Go Orioles. Got nowhere to go but up. I'm not an Orioles fan, but it's kind of sad. They were terrible. All right, this was Dear Baseball Gods.